Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in my series. Uh, reading Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Without further ado, returning to Oliver Twist as read by Lord Naren White. Mrs. Mann shook her head. He's an ill-conditioned, vicious, bad-disposed parochial child, said Mr. Bumble angrily. Where is he? I'll bring him to you in one minute, sir, replied Mrs. Mann. Here, you, Dick! After some calling, Dick was discovered. Having had his face put under the pump and dried upon Mrs. Mann's gown, he was led into the awful presence of Mr. Bumble, the beetle. The child was pale and thin. His cheeks were sunken, and his eyes large and bright. The scanty parish dress, the livery of misery, hung loosely on his feeble body, and his young limbs had wasted away like those of an old man. Such was the little being who stood trembling beneath Mr. Bumble's glance, not daring to lift his eyes from the floor, and dreading even to hear the beetle's voice. "'Can't you look at the gentleman, you obstinate boy?' said Mrs. Mann. The child meekly raised his eyes and encountered those of Mr. Bumble. "'What's the matter with you, parochial dick?' inquired Mr. Bumble, with well-timed jocularity. "'Nothing, sir.' replied the child, faintly. I should think not, said Mrs. Mann, who had, of course, laughed very much at Mr. Bumble's humor. You want for nothing, I'm sure. I should like, faltered the child. Heyday, interposed Mr. Mann. I suppose you're going to say that you do want for something now. Why, you little wretch. Stop, Mrs. Mann, stop, said the beetle raising his hand with a show of authority. Like what, sir, eh? I should like, said the child, to leave my dear love to poor Oliver Twist, and let him know how often I have sat by myself and cried to think of his wanderings about in the dark nights with nobody to help him. And I should like to tell him, said the child, pressing his small hands together and speaking with great fervor that I was glad to die when I was very young, for perhaps if I had lived to be a man and had grown old, my little sister, who is in heaven, might forget me or be unlike me, and would be so much happier if we were, were both children there together. Mr. Bumble surveyed the little speaker from head to foot with indescribable astonishment, and, turning to his companion, said, They're all in one story, Mrs. Mann that audacious Oliver had demogalized them all. I couldn't have believed it, sir, said Mrs. Mann, holding up her hands, and looking malignantly at Dick. I never see such a hardened little wretch. Take him away, ma'am, said Mr. Bumble, imperiously. This must be stated to the board, Mrs. Mann. I hope the gentleman will understand that it isn't my fault, sir said Mrs. Mann, whimpering pathetically. They shall understand that, ma'am. They shall be acquainted with the true state of the case, said Mr. Bumble. There, take him away. I can't bear the sight on him. Dick was immediately taken away and locked up in the coal cellar. Mr. Bumble shortly afterwards took himself off to prepare for his journey. At six o'clock next morning, Mr. Bumble, having exchanged his cocked hat for a round one and encased in his person in a blue great coat with a cape to it, took his place on the outside of the coach, accompanied by the criminals whose settlement was disputed, with whom in due time, of course, he arrived in London. He experienced no other crosses on the way than those which originated in the perverse behavior of the two paupers who persisted in shivering and complaining of the cold, in a manner which, Mr. Bumble declared, caused his teeth to chatter in his head, and made him feel quite uncomfortable. 
although he had a great coat on. Having disposed of these evil-minded persons for the night, Mr. Bumble sat himself down in the house at which the coach stopped and took a temperate dinner of steaks, oyster sauce, and porter. Putting a glass of hot gin and water on the chimney piece, he drew his fire's chair to the fire, with sundry moral reflections on the too prevalent sin of discontent and complaining, composed himself to read the paper. The very paragraph upon Mr. Bumble's eye rested was the following advertisement. Five guineas reward. Whereas a young boy named Oliver Twist absconded or was enticed on Thursday evening last from his home at Pentonville and has not since been heard of. The above reward will be paid to any person who will give such information as will lead to the discovery of the said Oliver Twist or tend to throw any light upon his previous history in which the advertiser is, for many reasons, warmly interested. And then, following a then followed a full description of Oliver's dress, person, appearance, and disappearance, with the name and address of Mr. Brownlow at full length. Mr. Bumble opened his eyes, read the advertisement slowly and carefully, three several times, and in something more than five minutes was on his way to Pentonville. Having actually in his excitement left the glass of hot gin and water untasted, "'Is Mr. Brownlow at home?' inquired Mr. Bumble, of the girl who opened the door. To this inquiry the girl returned the not uncommon, but rather evasive reply of, "'I don't know. Where do you come from?' Mr. Bumble no soon uttered Oliver's name in explanation of his errand. Then Mr. Mrs. Bedwin, who had been listening at the parlour door, hastened into the passage in a breathless state. Come in, come in, said the old lady. I knew we should hear of him. Poor dear, I knew we should. I was certain of it. Bless his heart, I said so all along. Having heard this, the worthy old lady hurried back into the parlour again, and seating herself on a sofa, burst into tears. The girl, who was not quite so susceptible, had run herself, had run upstairs meanwhile and now returned with a request that Mr. Bumble would follow her immediately, which he did. He was shown in, into, the last back, little, into the little back study, where sat Mr. Brownlow and his friend Mr. Grimwig, with decanters and glasses before them. The latter gentleman at once burst into the exclamation, A beetle! A parish beetle! Or oh, I'll eat my head! Pray, don't just don't interrupt just now, said Mr. Brownlow. Take a seat, will you? Mr. Bumble sat himself down, quite confounded by the oddity of Mr. Grimwig's manner. Mr. Brownlow moved the lamp so as to obtain an uninterrupted view of the beetle's countenance, and said with a little impatience, Now, sir, you come in consequence of having seen the advertisement. Yes, sir, said Mr. Bumble. And you are a beetle, are you not? inquired Mr. Grimwick. I am a parochial beetle, gentlemen, rejoined Mr. Bumble proudly. Of course, observed Mr. Grimwick, aside to his friend. I knew he was a beetle all over. Mr. Brownlow gently shook his head to impose silence on his friend and resumed. Do you know where this poor boy is now? No more than nobody, replied Mr. Bumble. Well, what do you know of him? inquired the old gentleman. Speak out, my friend. If you have anything to say, what do you know of him? You don't happen to know any good of him, do you? said Mr. Grimwig caustically, after an attentive perusal of Mr. Bumble's features. Mr. Bumble, catching at the inquiry very quickly, shook his head with portentous solemnity. You see, said Mr. Grimwig, looking triumphantly at Mr. Brownlow. Mr. Brownlow looked apprehensively at Mr. Bumble's pursed-up countenance and requested him to communicate what he knew regarding Oliver in as few words as possible. Mr. Brumble put down his hat, unbuttoned his coat, folded his arms, and inclined his head in a retrospective manner and, 
after a few moments' reflection, commenced his story. It would be tedious if given, in the Beatles' words occupying as it did, some twenty minutes in the telling, but the sum and substance of it was that Oliver was a foundling born of low and vicious parents. And we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care, and thanks again.